Okay. This is the third uh, presentation on this series, Spiritual Israel and the New Earth. I'll say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue talking about the prophecies of Daniel, help our minds to grasp all of these teachings and embrace them and share them with others. Help us share these prophecies of hope. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you, Lord. As your word tells us, Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep those at peace whose mind is stayed upon you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time I really ended right in the middle of a pretty intense um, prophecy, which is the prophecy in Daniel 8. Daniel 8, I was talking about the 2300-day prophecy, which is 2300 years, as I have explained, as it is in the context of the rise and fall of nations. So it couldn't be 2300 literal days. This prophecy was very important, but it was very confusing and difficult for Daniel, as Daniel 8, 27 tells us no one understood it. Gabriel appeared in Daniel 8, 16, and, and, and we see in verse 17, he was there to help, to help Daniel understand the prophecy. But Daniel didn't understand it. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, there's a long prayer. There's a long prayer. But when we get to the end of Daniel chapter 9, we do read in Daniel chapter 9, let's go to verse uh, 21. Daniel 9, 21. Well, I'm going to go to 20. Now, while I was speaking, uh, Daniel says, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and uh, presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my, uh, uh, of my God, so Daniel, Daniel is praying. So chapter nine is so chapter eight was the vision that left Daniel perplexed, that Gabriel was to help him understand. Chapter nine is a long prayer. So you had the vision of chapter eight, the vision of the evenings, mornings, to use the language of eight twenty six. Daniel nine, long prayer. Daniel still has questions about that vision, as Daniel 8, 27 reveals. Now, after the long prayer, we see in verse 21, Daniel 9, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. When is he talking about? Talking about Daniel 8, 16 and, and 17. That's where we see Gabriel. And so that vision is what he's clearly referring to, because that's where we first see Gabriel in that vision of chapter 8, the vision of the evening's mornings. Yes, while I was still in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, so this is the angel, reached me about the time of the evening offering so clearly about the time of the evening offering and he informed me and talked to me and said oh daniel i have now come forth to give you skill to understand at the beginning of your supplication the command went out and i have come to tell you for you are greatly beloved therefore consider the matter and understand the vision the vision Clearly, as we see in verse 21, the vision of chapter 8. So, Gabriel is going to tell him something that's going to help him understand the vision. Let us continue where we are in the presentation. So, Daniel 8 ends. No one understood the vision. Gabriel is going to make him understand the vision. Gabriel 
whom Daniel seen in the vision, as we saw, Daniel 8, 16 and 17, that's where Gabriel first appears. The vision of what? Chapter 8, the vision of the evening's mornings. And we compare that with Daniel 9, 21. He, that is the vision being referred to in 9, 21. Whose job was to make Daniel understand the vision. I have come forth to give you skill to understand. To understand what? The vision of Daniel 8. Understand the vision, 923. And so here he is. Now he reveals another prophecy. This prophecy is to help Daniel understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. In other words, for the Jewish people. So we're dealing with the subject of spiritual Israel and the new earth. Now, we're dealing with literal Israel here. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, for the Jewish people for your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy daniel 9 24 70 weeks now in the last presentation i had clearly explained how the 2300 days could not be literal days because of the context starting from Medo Persia going all the way to Papal Rome couldn't be literal days which would be a little over six years I believe so clearly we see the day year principle now these 70 weeks and what they involve also are not weeks of days but weeks of years and that comes out to 490 years A time determined for the Jewish nation. Now, that was Daniel's concern. That was his concern. The Jewish nation was his concern. And so, Gabriel is giving him this prophecy which concerns the Jewish nation. But when does it start? How does it end? How long is it? Well, we see it's the length is 490 years that are set aside for the Jewish nation. This time was set aside for them, giving them the opportunity to get things right. Because we had seen in history, we had seen that they had apostatized, they went into captivity because of it, they didn't meet the conditions, but eventually there was mercy shown, ultimately by God, during the reign of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, Ezra 6.14, and those kings of Medo-Persia allowed them to rebuild Jerusalem. And it was Artaxerxes who restored Jerusalem to them. In other words, he returned it to their authority. They were allowed to set up civil authorities by the decree of Artaxerxes. So these three kings and their decrees are mentioned in Ezra 6.14. Ezra 6.14. So they had a chance to get things right. They had a chance to, um, to be restored, to prepare to meet the Messiah. But what happened? They did not a fish as a nation accept the Messiah as a nation, officially. And again, as individuals, yes. But the official pronouncement of the nation, no. But they had that chance as a nation to do that. And so, this period of time, as we see, it starts with Medo-Persia. It starts with Medo-Persia, as Medo-Persia was there in the vision of Daniel chapter 8. This 490 years was a time for the Jewish nation to get things right. To get things right. Let us continue. Oh, and we also saw here, according to this language, to seal up vision and prophecy. And in an interesting way, the prophecy that is revealed here, this 490-year prophecy, would really in a sense, seal the prophecy of Daniel 8. Daniel 8, 
14 because it would provide a historical stamp. It would provide a historical point in time when that 2300 years could be understood to start, to have started. So, let us continue here. This 490 year prophecy is given, as we had seen, in the context of helping Daniel understand the vision. The vision of Daniel chapter 8, the vision of the evenings mornings, and the 2300 evenings mornings referred to in Daniel 8.14. When does this 490 years start? Well, we're going to find out. Know therefore and understand, and I had already spoken in relation to this and really given the answer, if you paid close attention, in the last presentation, and I'm going to speak about it again here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore, and I said, why, when did that restoration happen? The time of King Artaxerxes. The time of King Artaxerxes. We're going to look more at that. To restore and build, so restore is to return, and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So that's when it starts. The going forth of the command to restore, to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times even in troublesome times. So you have 70 weeks, or seven weeks rather, which is 49 years. Seven weeks is 49 years. Now you have 62 weeks, which is 434 years. And it's broken up like that, because in the 49 years, in the 49 years, that's when the, the building... Um, Really, the the, uh, the the building work was understood as being uh, completed. Okay? But then we have the 434 years after that, which come together 483 years. And we'll talk more about this. And what, what building, what, what do I mean when I say the building was completed? after the uh, 49 years. And we'll talk about that in a little, more, a little bit more depth. Okay, so when does it start? The command to restore. When did that happen? As I mentioned, restore means return or give back. As we see, for example, here in 2 Kings 14.22, but uh, he built Elath and restored it, restored it to Judah after the king rested with his father. So re restored means return. So ben Haddon said to him, The cities which my father took from your father I will restore, I will return. And again we see in 2 Kings 8, 6, Restore all that was hers and all the proceeds of the field from the day that she left the land until now. So these passages reveal that re to restore is to return. So when did that restoration happen? Here we see Ezra 7.6 tells us, uh, starting in Ezra 7.6, and we're going to read to Ezra 7.8. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had made. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him, some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year. Now we have a year, the seventh year of Artaxerxes, and Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king, seventh year of Artaxerxes. Now we could read the decree of Artaxerxes from verse 12 to 26. And so it was in the seventh year of Artaxerxes when this was done. When this was put into effect, when this went forth, this decree. And what does it say in verse 25 in the decree? 
And you, Ezra, according to your God, given wisdom, set magistrates and judges. So he is restoring, he is re returning to the authority of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. That is the restoration. You know, it's not just about building, but he is restoring their authority. Set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river. All such as know the laws of your God and teach those who do not know them. So there is a restoration there. They're being encouraged, even encouraged to know the laws of God. Okay, and to teach those who do not know them. So this is a restoration now. It's not simply a matter of rebuilding. And that happens in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So when does it start? It starts the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And you could look that up in your history books or online. 457 B.C. Then it says, after the 62 weeks, which were after the seven weeks, Messiah, so this is after 483 years, it says, Messiah shall be cut off. And that is Jesus, shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So that desolating power would come. Rome would come. But it would come after this rejection of the Messiah. After this rejection of the Messiah. After the Messiah was cut off. And he is cut off after 483 years. So here we have the starting point of this period of time that Daniel is being made to understand in order to help him to also understand the prophecy, the vision of chapter 8, the 2300 year prophecy. So 457 and 483 years brings us to 27 AD. 27 AD. And sometime after that would be the crucifixion. Let us continue. The Bible says then, further, Daniel 9, 27, He, that is Christ, the Messiah, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. How? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the ultimate sacrifice. So the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was done away with because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins, according to what we read in the book of Hebrews 10.4. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This is the New King James Version. So, after the rejection, after the rejection of Christ and Christ is crucified, we are reading that it is an end of sacrifice and offering. An end of sacrifice and offering. So let's go back now to the image. So here we have the last seven years, the last week of years. So you had the 483 bringing us to 27 AD from 457, so from 457 BC, and the last seven years, the middle of the year, 31 AD. And as I had spoken in the previous installment in this series, I had spoken clearly that when we looked in the book of Acts 6-7, we saw that the gospel was prospering after Jesus was crucified, after Jesus resurrected, after Jesus ascended. The gospel was prophesying. It was, it was prospering, rather, in Jerusalem. It was prospering. Many of the priests came in, Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. But then what finally happened? Stephen was stoned to death, and a great persecution burst forth, Acts chapter 8. Right in the beginning, reveal that. And the church was scattered from Jerusalem. And then what happened? The gospel started going out to the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Paul. 
who specifically goes out to witness to the Gentiles. So the stoning of Stephen is the cutoff time. And that means it would have been the end of that week. And that would have been the end of the 490 years, bringing us to 34 AD. And so this, this is the 490 year prophecy, which is specifically concerning the Jewish nation, as that was Daniel's interest to understand. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist quarterly of October, December 2004 tells us, the prophecy says that the Messiah will confirm the covenant with many for one week. What does that mean, and when does it end? Our basic understanding of this the end of the final week is the covenant relationship between the Lord and national Israel. After that week, which comes to A.D. 34, and which we tie to the stoning of Stephen, as I have explained why in Acts chapter 7, the new covenant promises went to the church, which composed of Jews, the natural branch, and Gentiles, the wild branch, became an extension of Israel to use the reference in Romans, and continued with the work of teaching the world about the true God, the Creator, and the Redeemer. So the church of Jew and Gentile, as I mentioned, spiritual Israel, would now carry on where literal Israel had fallen short. Okay, so... As we see here in um, Hebrews, Hebrews 10.4, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats. It, they could not take away sins. And Christ's death fulfills God's will. See in verse 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. This is Jesus. I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So Jesus comes, as I mentioned last time, the law and the prophets, the prophecies, the whole writing of scriptures, the work of the prophets that God inspired through his Holy Spirit, they point to Jesus. And so we read, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. That is Jesus speaking to the Father. Previously saying, verse 8 now, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire. So as we saw in the middle of the week, when Jesus was crucified, that put an end to that sacrificial system. Nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, to the old covenant law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that is the first covenant, that he might establish the second. By that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So Jesus caused those Old Testament sacrificial system to be made obsolete to use Hebrews 8.13. Hebrews 9.25-28 Not that he should offer, this is talking about Jesus, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has, prepared, he, he has appeared to put away sin and sacrifice, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus puts away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. 
he will appear the second time apart from sin for salvation. So Christ was offered up the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. We read about John the Baptist when he saw Jesus said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As we see in John 1, 29. So Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, is what we are seeing here. Jesus is the one that in the middle of that week, that was 31 AD, so we start 457, we end 31 AD, the gospel was still tolerated to a certain degree until finally the official death decree, the death decree, the close of probation, the death decree was put into effect, Stephen was stoned to death, and there was an outburst, a persecution, a great persecution, as we see in the book of Acts chapter 8, triggered with the stoning of Stephen. And so the stoning of Stephen, when Stephen, he had seen Jesus standing at the right hand with God. He had seen Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. Standing. Now, the Bible tells us that all must come before the judgment seat of Christ in the book of Romans, chapter 14 and verse 10. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We see in the book of Daniel 7, 10, court seated, books open. So that when the um, investigative judgment of Daniel 7.10 is happening, the court is seated, the books are open. And if we look further in Daniel chapter 7 and uh, verse number, let's go to verse number 20, let's see, 22, this seated judgment of Daniel 7.10, it is referred to as a judgment, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. So when this process of investigation is over, probation closes, Michael stands up. So there is the seated judgment, and then there is the time of standing up. The decision has been made. And so, when we see Jesus standing up at the stoning of Stephen, that was the close of probation. The close of probation, the finishing of the 490 year period that Gabriel had told Daniel about. The finishing of the 490 year period. Let's continue. Hebrews 8. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest, that is Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. So now the Bible is telling us that Jesus is the minister of the true tabernacle. Now the Bible is telling us Jesus is a minister of the high uh, Jesus is our high priest, and he is the minister of the true tabernacle, the heavenly sanctuary which God has erected, and not man. And in verse 13, Hebrews 8, I mentioned before, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. So the old covenant had the earthly sanctuary, the Old Covenant had the earthly sacrifices of animals, but the New Covenant has the blood of Jesus, and Jesus functions as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And so that is the sanctuary that is being cleansed, according to Daniel 8.14. There is a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, verse 28, we read here, Matthew 26.28. Jesus says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
So let's take a look at this diagram again. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And so here we have a clear uh, reference to this entire prophecy. Clear diagram of the 490-year prophecy, which Daniel had received from Gabriel to help him to understand, as we saw, to help him understand the vision of the evenings and mornings in chapter 8 of Daniel, the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. So here we have it all broken down, as we can see here. We see here the seven weeks of 49 years. Now, according to the 220 quarterly, on uh, Reve Daniel Revelation, Adventist Quarterly, it tells us Jerusalem rebuilt. 408, Jerusalem rebuilt. Okay, so then we have the 483 years. So we have the 62, the 483 years, the 49 plus the 434, bringing us to 27 AD. The last week, Jesus causes the sacrifices to cease because he becomes the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. So these are the things that we are seeing here. These are the things that we are seeing in this prophecy. And they were there to help Daniel understand. Now, how would this help him to understand? How would it help him to understand? Well, let's take a look. After Stephen's death, the Gentiles come in. After the stoning of Stephen and the persecution that follows, the church was scattered. With it, the gospel spread abroad eventually to the Gentiles. And we saw Acts 8 1 already. A Seventh day Adventist Bible commentary, volume 6, 2 12 says, This may have served as the first step in breaking down the antipathy toward the Samaritans and eventually the Gentiles. So the stoning of Stephen and the persecution that followed, as the Bible commentary says, may have served in the first step. And that is really what happened. And then as I said, Acts chapter 9, conversion of Saul. So let's go back here and look at this again. This is the prophecy that was revealed to Daniel at the end of chapter 9. Gabriel using this prophecy to help Daniel understand the vision of chapter 8. It is a period of time specifically for the Jewish nation. And so here we see that according to Luke, as you can see at the bottom of this image here, according to Luke, that Christ was baptized at about 30 years of age. Luke 3, 1, and then we can look at 21 to 23. That's a reference for you. About 30 years. So Jesus began his ministry very late. Very late. And that was about, that was 27 AD. That was when the baptism of Jesus happened. 27 AD. That's when he began his ministry. Now, we can see how this entire prophecy fits. Let's take a look. 457. Okay, well, let's see here. Okay, yes. So there you see this 490-year prophecy is the beginning of the 2300. So now we can clearly see how, now we can clearly see how it, it helps to understand it, how it provides us with an anchor point in history to help us understand a 20, 2300 days prophecy. The 70 week prophecy was, as we saw, to help Daniel understand the vision of chapter eight. That is what we saw. And so what is revealed here? Jesus cleanses the heavenly sanctuary 
Okay, well, I'm going to stop there because that is the next phase of our discussion. And there is a lot to talk. What does that mean? The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Well, that's a, that is going to be another involved talk. But we have seen, we have seen the transfer of literal Israel to spiritual Israel with the stoning of Stephen. And that we are to be faithful and not to make the mistake of those who had apostatized and turned away from God and broken his laws and broken his commandments. But we are to be as the faithful remnant of Israel. We are to be faithful to the word of God. We are to keep the commandments of God. We are to be used by him to do his work in this world. And God has a wonderful, wonderful promise, a wonderful promise for those who remain faithful. And to be, remain faithful, we have to stay surrendered. It's not by might nor power but by the Spirit of God. I want to give you these words of encouragement because we might say, well, how can we remain faithful? If so many have failed before, how can we do it? How can we remain faithful? I'm going to turn in the Bible. And this is something we have to keep in mind. Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. I'll read you another one. He that began a good work in you. See, it's the, all we have to do is surrender. It's not by might nor power. Again, we see the same idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let us continue here and look at verse number six. Even as the test, well, let me, let me go to verse four. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. The testimony of Christ is confirmed in spiritual Israel, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting, waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is not a matter of our might or power, but it is a matter of surrendering to Christ. Because remember, remember, I'm going to, uh, I know I was said I was going to end, but I do want to read a couple of other verses to really bring this point home. I want to turn to the book of Joshua, the very last uh, chapter of that book. And what it says in Joshua 24, and I believe 19. And look what Joshua says here. Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord. Imagine that. After all that happened, they had conquest, defeated the enemies. But look what he says. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. And we saw that is what happened. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. But he says you cannot serve. But what does Paul say in Philippians? See, in our own strength, we cannot be faithful. But Philippians 4.13, through Jesus Christ. I could do all things. God bless you.